I'm going to, I want to, I'm, I'm really excited about the man of God that will be coming to minister today. And as you're giving, uh, I'm going to invite uh, my sister Pam to come. And I asked her, I said uh, a couple of weeks ago, I said, would you, would you sing? <laughs> Pam is, Pam has been not able to come. She's been at home. As many of you know, mom and dad, uh, dad is 93. He turned 93 last Saturday. And uh, praise the Lord. And uh, uh, mom is 90. She turned 90 last month. And, but as they are aging, uh, they're dealing with some of the things that people their age deal with and they're not able to be here. If you're watching today, dad and mom, we love you. God bless you. We thank God for you. Pam's been, been home with them most of the time. We have others that are serving as well. Some of you have gone by. Most of you have been praying for them. We appreciate you so very, very much. And uh, Pam used to serve here a lot more, been able to do a lot more. A lot of that got, a lot of that got changed over the years. And uh, but I asked her, you know, during the anniversary, we usually try to do what they do in weddings. Get, take this right. Something old, something blue, right? Uh, something new. And, and so she represents the old days. Back when we came and she, she, was, in the, she was in the first meeting and the babies were small. Uh, they're all grown now and they're having babies, but I always like to be able to reach back. Sister Shelly is here. She's one of the first members here at Metro. Wave a hand, Shelly. Love you. One of our very, very first. Amen. She's been with us over the years, and, and uh, so many of you that have come and stayed, been here 20, 25 years, 30 years. Uh, the relationship that we have in the Lord is, is priceless to us. And we thank you. We thank you so much. Uh, Raphael Green is not Metro. But as one of the appointed leaders here, I want to represent all of the leaders and say we thank you. We thank you for supporting. We thank you for committing. We thank you for hanging in here with us when the rep was good, when the, when the place was packed out, and for sticking around even when we thinned out a little bit. You've been here. And uh, give yourself a hand. God bless you. We love you. So very much. So very, very much. Next month, we're going to take a little time. We, we're not going to do it now to, to give special honor to several of you because there's no way this happens with me or Pastor Brenda alone. It's the effort and the work of so many, many people that over the, a long period of time that has made this possible. And we want you to know that we appreciate you. We love you. And more importantly, God loves you and has taken note of your faithfulness to him. Let's welcome Pam as she comes to minister. Good morning. Why well, it's been so long. <laughs> it is so good to see you all. Really, it is. And like Pastor was saying, we thank you so much for the love and support that you gave us. Um, when mom and dad had to be homebound, um, that, that is the main reason why you have not seen me. I've been at home taking care of my parents. Um, <laughs> We've had the help of several of the saints to come and to give, but mainly I've been there making sure mommy was okay, daddy was okay. They gave to us when we couldn't help ourselves and it's just no, no less that I should give back to my parents. I'm thankful this morning. I want to give honor to my bishop and my pastor, Pastor Brenda and Bishop, for just giving me this opportunity. I also give honor to Bishop Garlington for being here today, and I give honor to God, who is the head of my life. I love God. I love him with all of my heart, and I thank him for where he has brought me from, what he has brought me to, and what he has done and is doing in my life. Many of you know that um, I'm a teacher by trade. That's what I do every day, Monday through Friday, year in and year out. I look at the bright, shiny faces of 
four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. This year I have eight and nine-year-olds. And one of the things that amazes me about the children is that out of all the things that we do to get children so that they're learning and that they're doing what they need to do, I've seen over the years that the child that gets the most from me is the child that has an expectation of me. The child that comes to the classroom and he's looking for Miss Keys to do something. Miss Keys, can you help me? Miss Keys, I have a question. Miss Keys, I need your help. That child is the one that gets my attention because they came into the room expecting something. This morning when I was coming to, to church, the Holy Spirit said, ask everybody, what are you expecting? Did you come expecting something from God this morning? Because I promise you, if you come to God expecting something, he'll meet you. He'll be there for you. The child that says to me, Miss Keys, I need your help, I run to that child. The child that said, Miss Keys, I need you, I'm right there. And if your expectation is of God this morning, you're looking to him this morning, he'll be there. And he won't disappoint. I want to sing a song this morning that talks about the goodness and the mercy of God. And it just, it's just really a worship tune. And if you know it, join in with me. I'm okay with you singing out there. It's okay with me. So just worship with me as we sing, as I sing.
I'll tell him all my life. Come on, whisper this to him. Say, all my life. Because all my life you have been faithful. Come on, think about it. In all my life you have been so. Tell him with every breath. Every breath that I am. I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Father. We worship you in this moment, Jesus. Come on, tell it one more time. I'm going to worship with all my life. You have been faithful. Oh, yes, you have. All my life, you have been so good. Thank you, Jesus. With every breath. Everything within me, oh God, you are worthy of my praise. I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, tell me, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Amen. All my life, all my life, all my life, you've been faithful. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. My God. We're really grateful for the opportunity to be able to gather like this and also have the opportunity to hear such a wonderful man of God. I was telling the leaders yesterday, the first time I heard then uh, Bishop Garland didn't speak. Uh, I was probably just a young teenager. I'd just been saved a few years. My mother attended a church. Uh, my, my mother, my grandmother attended a church in North St. Louis. Still there, still going on. And he was there in that church ministering. And God had dealt with me about ministry and about being involved. And as I looked around, I saw people I admired but I didn't feel like I related to them in many ways or the style in which they ministered. And so it, you know, I couldn't do what they did. And so it, it kind of put me in a quandary for how ministry ought to look and what's involved in it in my own life and in my generation. But as he ministered that day, I began to get hope. I began to see a picture of what it, what it really involved and what it entailed. Not only in terms of the delivery of the word of God, but even in style and individuality and uniqueness. Uh, Bishop Garlington and his wife, Barbara, are veterans in the, in the ministry. Um, he's been involved in ministry himself almost 70 years. And so for me, this is, this is very, very special. He's kind of been a a mentor at large. We've had a few conversations, but uh, he invited me to be a part of a number of things that God used to help build and mold and shape my personal life and, and Brenda's life. Uh, his heart is really for God. Uh, he's extremely talented, very, very intelligent. My, my word for him, my phrase for him is anointed brilliance. That's, that's kind of how I think of him, anointed brilliance. We got some fleshly brilliance, some carnal brilliance. Then we have some anointed brilliance. <laughs> He's in that group. Very, very sharp. And the church that he and his wife were a part of helping to found and establish in Pittsburgh Covenant Church is a powerful church and used of God in that region and around the world. And uh, he has a great voice. He sings. He's recorded music. They have a a big center that they they purchased a building, a school, and out of it they they're operating and touching the entire metropolitan area as well as I'm sure the state uh, through social, economic, other needs that are that are met and need to be met. Uh, much of what they are doing, God has charged us to do. I'm hoping that in the future we'll get a chance to take a delegation and go and just observe and look. I've had the privilege of being able to stand on the platform and the local church there and to minister the word of God there. 
Uh, he took a chance on me. And I'll never forget that. He's, he's honored what God spoke in my life. But uh, that's not why he's here. He's here because there's real, a real word of God in his heart. There's a call of God upon his life to father and to minister and to help us to grow. Unlike Rehoboam, who only wanted to talk to his friends, uh, I, I kind of like listening to the older guys. They've been where we're trying to go in one way, shape, or form. They can help us. And we've already been helped privately and also in our meeting yesterday. And uh, I could just go on and on about this man of God, but uh, you get the point, right? You get the point. Let's stand on our feet and welcome him as he comes. Dr. Joseph Garlington, as he comes to minister God's word. Bless the Lord. Come on, Metro, let's pray. this for a moment. Good morning. I'm, I'm so glad that uh, Pam sang the song that I was going to sing. Um, it's been my theme song. and uh, I, I feel like there are moments in my life when, when God gives me a particular song that opens grace in ways that I don't get it in other places. And, and uh, you remember we some of you don't go back this far, but there used to be restaurants that would have little jukeboxes right at the, uh, the table. And you could flip through and find your song and you would look through it. And, and what you were looking for was your song. That means the song that moves you, that touches something inside you at that point. And, but there were times when you'd sit there and before you could pick your song, somebody had already picked it. And you would turn to your, your wife or your girlfriend and you would say, they're playing my song. So she was singing my song. And the reason that song is important to me is because all my life, without a blip on the screen, he's been faithful. And his faithfulness isn't dependent upon how faithful you are, but it's because it's the way he is. It's the only way God knows how to be. He only knows how to be faithful. And um, I love that, that thought all my life. Somebody say all my life. Even if you don't know it. Remember you used to, they used to tell us, it said he's been, he's been there for me even when I didn't know he was there. And a lot of them say he was good to me and I didn't know he was being good, but he was good. And he doesn't run behind you saying, hey, I just saved you from a car accident or I just did this for you. He just lets you go and you enjoy it. Bishop, it's so good to be with you and, and your, your beautiful wife to just to renew fellowship once again. I love the idea that sometimes people that God puts in your life, if you don't see them in a long time, when you do see them, you don't have to start all over. You just start like where we were left off. I feel like when Jesus was on the mountain with Moses and Elijah, he could say to Moses, as I was saying to you on the other mountain, because that's how he works. I'm so glad to have my associates with me. This is Steve Shelton. He's one of the guys in our church who has a prophetic voice. And then, of course, there is the Dennis. And uh, Dennis is a psalmist. So appreciate your, your time with us. Um, I'm going to have Steve come in just a moment. I don't know how this service is going to end. I know it's going to, but I don't know how. Um, and I, I don't want to disappoint you, and I don't know when, but I do know it's going to have an ending. But there are resources that we brought, and... I don't want to announce resources if we're in the glory. So what I have is uh, we brought a book, a book that I wrote. Um, 
it's the best book I've ever read on worship that I wrote. Um, and it's a manual for worship. If you want to understand what worship is, I would call it worship the pattern of things in heaven. What we're doing here on earth is, is really a pattern of what's already going on. They're already worshiping in heaven. They don't wait till Sunday at 11. They're doing it now. And a lot of what you do in worship, you need to understand from a point of view that gets you on to where God wants to take you. And then we brought some messages. We used to take CDs and cassettes, and, and it was laborious. And then uh, my associate found something that enabled him to put more than one message on this, this really great device. Technology has lowered the price of our offerings, and uh, we used to charge $5 for a, a CD, and now you can get... 22 messages on worship on this little card, and that's available to you. You can also get, um, these things are really funny, wealth. I may believe God wants you to be a lot better off than you are. You think there's enough money to go around, there's enough prosperity, but God wants to teach you and to talk to you about wealth. I grew up poor. And um, I learned how to give different words for poverty when I went to uh, college. I was marginalized and I was disenfranchised and I was still poor, but I had a great vocabulary. Um, worship is what we are. We are worshipers. And uh, this is a series on worship. And um, there's also a series on warfare. Many of you are in warfare, but you don't realize it's warfare. And uh, the enemy doesn't want you to survive. He doesn't want you to end up in his, in your perfect will of, of God, but he's going to do everything he can to keep you from doing that. When I'm getting resisting, resistance, I'm saying to God, God, what is going on? And um, sometimes he'll just simply say, put your helmet on, get your armor on, and you begin to resist and fight. My wife is uh, older than I am. I married an older woman. She's uh, 84. I'm 33. Uh, I'm actually 83, just, just right behind her. And we've enjoyed life, but we've had the battle for the promises that God's made us. And uh, he will say to you, there's the promised land over there. And I say, great. I said, what's missing in that promise that you just made to me? He said, giants. And I said, can I have the land without giants? He says, you can have the giants and not the land, but you're going to get what God has for you, but you're going to labor for it. And spiritual warfare is one of the ways that we do that. We did a CD on worship. It's a live CD from our church, and, and uh, there are other resources out of there. Steve, would you just come for a moment and... Uh, Steve is a prophet, and uh, he hears and he sees, and there's some wonderful things that he did see. And yesterday, we had an amazing time, Bishop, with your, with the, with the generals, <laughs> with the generals. It's a great word. But uh, when we were preparing to come, I, I asked Steve, I said, I need you to go with me to St. Louis. This is his first time here, so would you welcome him and let him know that But he is a Pittsburgh Pirates fan, so I just need to warn you that that might slip in someplace. But uh, as he was waiting on the Lord, God began to say several things to him about, about this house and this time together. And then there were several thoughts that God gave him while he was in the meeting. And uh, is Kyan here? Okay, great. So we have a word for Kyan too. Good morning. So last Wednesday, uh, I get up and I pray about 5 o'clock in the morning. And as soon as I sat down to pray, God said, start typing. And this is what he gave me for this church. And the cool part about this was is I didn't know the church. I didn't know the pastors. I didn't know anything about where I was coming. And God told me to tell you this. 
I heard the words West Side Outlook Outreach. I saw the staff sitting together and discussing and saying, okay, what's next? God says, there's a huge blessing behind a curtain on the west side. As I heard the word curtain, I sensed that it is a spiritual curtain that God wants to pull back and reveal the treasure that's there in that region of town on the west side. There have been multiple curses spoken over that region in the past years, and the Lord says, send a team of intercessors, even in a drive-by, drive-through mode. They're to pray and break strongholds of those curses that have been plagued, that have plagued it for many years. To the lead pastors of this church, the Lord says, wheels up, seats back, get ready for a season of some traveling. Yes, the airlines are not as dependable as normal, but I'll make sure you're safe and sound and reach all destinations that I send you. There's a very distinct gift that this house carries it has been prominent for many years. God says, now get ready to expand your thinking and prayer lives and receive multiple gifts by the Spirit that will transform this house and this region. With Bishop Garlington traveling here, I saw him carrying heaven's mailbag. This house will never be the same as, bishop, as the bishop just coming here is carrying a refreshing that you've been looking for. Heaven's heard your cry for what's next. The anointing and gifting that he carries not be for just this weekend, but will be deposited in many of you to carry on out of this house and impact many, many lives. The impact in the government arena through a certain couple in this house will be instrumental in many lives being saved and transformed. I've set this time, and yes, this is a set time. I've been getting, re getting you ready for, says God. Do not despise what you've been through. With all of the past challenges, as they've readied you for this monumental, instrumental season that is upon this house. And yesterday morning, as I sat on the front row and Bishop Garlington right after worship got up and he started to share, he was standing down here. And as he started to share, behind him, right up here, were these gigantic golden transparent oil drops that were falling from the ceiling. And as they came down, there was a river that was flowing from that side to this side. And the river, as the drops, you know how you know when you go to a lake or you see a drop of water just drop into a, a, a pan or something, and you see you see the rings going out from it. Those oil drops were dropping in the river, reverberating out, traveling out into this city. There's a river of God that'll flow out of this house in the days to come. It has the anointing to break every sort of yoke that there is, there is in the kingdom of darkness, says the Lord. That river is going to touch many businessmen and women, and men, men and women who are passionately pursuing God. Many of them are looking for a man and woman of God to follow and serve. God spoke to me about Bishop Raphael. Pastor Brenda, that river that's flowing out of here, it's going to touch a lot of lives. There are powerful, godly men and women who are very plainly have had enough of the craziness in this world. They'll find you, and, you'll, and you will speak godly wisdom into their lives and into their businesses. Bishop and Pastor, as, as you saw the dreams and visions you had the past few years that you had, that the past few years squashed. God told me to tell you, he has a much larger vision than what you had for this house. God says, get ready yourselves to be impeccably blessed, exceedingly abundantly, more than you could possibly ask or think. 
Pastor Brenda, God says you're a quiet rock. There's such a beautiful family anointing on you. And that you have experienced, all that you have experienced and learned through the years, God says, I'm going to put the writings that you have. You're going to have a book, and the one you always wanted to write. God says to all of you here today, this is the time you all have been waiting for. So jump in the river of God. Make the most of what I've instilled in you. And with what I'm going to bless you with in these days ahead. Later that afternoon, yesterday, I looked out into the audience. And as I looked at the leadership, every one of the leaders. So, okay. Okay. Yes, sir. You had a word. Good morning. Uh, yesterday, as we were in, in prayer and worship, there was a moment when uh, Bishop called for the elders to come to the front. And as they were walking, I, I felt uh, my shoulders suddenly get extremely heavy, as if I was carrying something. And I was like, what is this? I don't, that doesn't usually happen to me. And I felt like the Lord was saying that in the last years, every time there was a disappointment, leadership was taking up a burden and carrying it. Every time there was a delay, you picked up a burden and you carried it. Every time there was a key person who left, you picked it up, you picked up the burden and, and were carrying it. And it happened so often and so much that you became accustomed to the burden. Uh, and even though you remained faithful in serving and faithful in coming every single week and in praying, you still have that burden uh, on you. And I felt like the Lord was saying that this weekend, um, it's time to say, this is not my burden. Would you say it? This is not my burden. Now is the time to release the burden. There's only one burden that you have to carry. And that is the burden of the Lord. And, and Jesus says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So the burdens that have been weighing you down, the burdens that you've taken up with all of these delays and disappointments, it is not your burden. You're going to be tempted to pick up some of those burdens as you walk, continue to walk. And there's situations that are going to remind you of the burdens that you passed, that you passed in the past you picked up. Uh, but in those moments, you've got to say to yourself, you've got to say to your partners, this is not our burden. Our burden is the burden of the Lord. It is light. It's a lot easier to dance with a light burden. It's a lot easier to laugh with a light burden. It's a lot easier to come in joy with a light burden. So get ready. So long ago, it seems so long ago that we were able to say, touch your neighbor. And then something came along and said, your neighbor's too far away to touch. So, uh, but you look like you're close enough. So if you feel comfortable, just ask your neighbor, can I touch you? And, uh, and let's just come in agreement. I have this, I don't know how to describe it other than in the fact that I just, I feel the tenderness of God and um, almost to the place where Maybe the best thing that I can do is, is just weep and be broken before him because prophecy tells you that God is thinking about you. When you hear a word from the Lord, it's a statement to you that says, I'm thinking about you, I've got you on my mind. And prophecy is like a love letter. And so say these words to me, with me, Holy Spirit, I open my heart to you to give me today all that I need for the journey that's ahead. I receive your word. Amen. Holy Spirit.
I was hearing these words. The glory is coming back. 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 The glory is not in what I think. It's not what I see, but glory is, it's like something you can't explain and you have to have been in it. And there have been moments in your life when God has brought you someplace and he's taken you someplace and you sat there and you just said, oh my God. And back in those days, we didn't know OMG. We just, oh my God. You can't have the glory without exalting Holy Spirit. He exalts Christ. There's a neighborhood around here. There's a, a city here. And as much as you would love to see a lot of things take place, sometimes your assignment is in a place where people have given up on it. But God has it. The glory is coming back. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. Lord, your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place. And fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living home. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence. Your presence, Lord. Come on, stand with me. Sing Holy Spirit. Holy are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long to be 
overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Sing it with me. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become Let us experience Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Sing that. Come on, lift your voice. You may be seated. Jesus told his disciples in that very familiar passage in John 14. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He says, and then he begins to talk about someone called the father. And one of the disciples said, uh, father? He says, yes. He says, when you see me, you've seen the father. In other words, every attribute that the father has, I have. And you've seen it in me. Every attribute that Jesus has, the Holy Spirit has. But you don't know the Holy Spirit yet. You do know him, but you don't know him. And many times the Holy Spirit will, will come and he will be present with us. But because we, we don't know him, we, we miss him. 
Could you resolve in your heart that whatever God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are determined to accomplish on earth, he still wants to use you. And we're looking around and we are thinking, and a lot of people are thinking, well, is the end of the world near? Well, not if the end of the world depends upon a bride ready. I've done a lot of weddings recently and when the bride wasn't on time, wasn't ready, bore down on me. Jesus wants his bride ready and it's gonna take a bride that's ready to get him to even think about coming back. While we are getting ready, he says, you know the way. The problem with knowing something and not knowing that you know it. My wife was telling me about a particular sister in our church and she said, uh, she said, honey, you know her. And so she would describe her and I said, no, I don't know her. And then she would try to describe her another way and then I would say, no, I don't know her. But after about 20 minutes, I, I did something like this. I said, oh, her. And she said, yes, I knew you knew her. Well, I still didn't know her. <laughs> but it was a few weeks later that this lady that she'd been describing came in, and she said, there she is. I said, oh, I know her. Because there are some things you don't know you know. There is something about God that you don't know, you know. He created you in his image, so there's got to be something about him that you know, even though they say there is no God, something inside of you saying, yeah, but there's something in me that tells me there is a God. I can't figure that out. So the disciples were walking along with him after his resurrection and they're discussing the fact that he's not there and he's gone and all of their hopes that were locked in on this one person it's not there it's it's finished and Jesus happens to walk alongside him and he says to these guys what are you talking about what's going on and they asked Jesus he said are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's going on. And Jesus said, like what? And they begin to tell Jesus what had happened to him. And as they were telling him, we had hoped that he would be the one that would. And it was like Jesus got fed up and he came close to them and he spoke these words of encouragement. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the Father has spoken, all that the scriptures have spoken, and beginning in the law and in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, he began to speak to them about all the things concerning himself in the scriptures. That must have been some kind of conversation if they could have taped those things in those days. What did he say? They got to their home, and they were turning in, and Jesus, Luke says, he made as if he would go a little further. And they said, oh, no, 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 sir, come, come, come on in. Come on in, have dinner with us. And so he responded to their invitation, Tracy. And they sat down, and they brought the bread out, and, and it was their honor to give the bread to the stranger so that he could do the ceremony. You know that? phrase in the scriptures, he took the bread, say that, he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread. If you were a disciple and you've been around him long, you would know what that looked like when he took the bread. And they gave it to them, still thinking he's dead and we're trying to figure out where we're going to go on from here. But the Bible says he took the bread he broke the bread and he blessed the bread 
He blessed it and he broke it. And interestingly enough, their eyes were open. And they said these words to one another. I know who that was. Their eyes were open and he, he disappeared. He just left. And they looked at one another and said, Did not our hearts burn within us while he spoke to us on the way? And they looked at one another and said, He's not dead. They said, We got to go tell somebody he's not dead. Tell somebody he's not dead. Come on, said he's not dead. I don't think I don't think it was just one of those momentary things where you you walk into a room and you say, "Hey guys, I uh, got some news to tell you. He's not dead." No, I think there's something in you when you encounter Holy Spirit, when you encounter Jesus, when you encounter the Word of God, and it begins to address some deep need that you had in your life. It answers a question. You're sitting in a church service and you're wondering why you're there. And all of a sudden it's as though the preacher starts talking just to you and you're looking at your wife saying, did you tell him we were coming to church? And it's not like that at all because your heart began to burn. I belong to a group called the Fellowship of the Burning Hearts. I think you're part of that group. Anybody a part of that group? Because when you hear God say something to you, whether it's on the bus or whether you might be in a movie theater looking at a movie that has nothing to do with God and a line will come across in that movie and it'll, it'll bring tears from your eyes. I was sitting watching a movie, I can't think of the name of it, the performer or something like that. This guy was leading a circus. But the closing song in that movie was Never Be Enough. It will never be enough. And I thought, oh my God. And I began to think of all the things that God had done. And I just sat there watching a secular movie, crying like a baby because something in me was touching something beyond that movie, it was touching that phrase. My heart was burning. Sometimes you got to go outside the church to hear something good. And that's the tragedy because this ought to be the house of good news. So what do you do when you have an encounter with the Jesus that you thought was dead? You saw him crucified. You, you saw him totally wrecked his face, marred beyond recognition. No one would recognize his own mother who saw that God would look at him. And the, Isaac, the prophet Isaac said, you wouldn't recognize his countenance. And there he is. You couldn't see him because you weren't expecting. And you couldn't see him because it's hard to see people who ain't there anymore. And they go running to Jerusalem. Because here's how Mark described it. He appeared to them in a different form. What kind of form would that be that would cause you to look at somebody that you were intimately acquainted with for three and a half years and now you can't see him? Because he has this capacity to show himself to you the way you want to see him, the way you expect to see him. And many times my expectation, it's like being in a meeting sometimes. I'm sitting in, in a service and I'm trying to figure out why am I here? What, what's the point? And these guys see him. Hearts burn they say, we got to go tell somebody. And they go running down to Jerusalem and breaking into a room where guys were as broken and crying as they were crying and begin to say something like, I think it would have been like, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. He's not dead. He's not dead. He's alive. He's alive. Hey, guys, he's alive. And the scripture said, for brokenness, heart 
heartbreaking sorrow and grief. They couldn't believe him. Mary, she came. She said, I think she said the same song. I just saw Jesus. I've just seen Jesus. And I'll never be the same again. Or maybe she said, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. He's not dead, he's not dead. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive. He's alive. And they didn't believe her. Holy Spirit wants you to know you have the capacity of telling people that they're alive. Our problem is that we don't know who we are. Remember the movie The Lion King? Anybody ever see that movie? Everybody see that play? It's a great play. There are a lot of things that are going on in that play, a lot of moving parts, Steve. But when the young lion was off, there was this creature who had a little stick, and he, he whacked him across the head, and he said, remember who you are. Remember, it's hard to remember who you are if you never knew who you are. It's hard to realize what you have when you don't realize what you have. I'm going to ask you just to take a, take a few minutes out of this message or in the message, and I want you to look at a video because I want to tell you who you are. You stop. stop it right there. Just pause it. The glimpse was taking you into outer space. When, when God said to Abraham, if you can count the stars, he knew he couldn't. Because the galaxy in which you and I are part of, it has trillions of stars. So there's no way that Abraham could count the stars, and God knew that. But if you could count the stars, so shall. And so what you're seeing is a picture of this galaxy that telescopes, newer telescopes, are showing us that there's even more out there than they could see with the older telescopes. Solomon said, the heavens of heavens can contain you. All of this God created, and the creator is bigger than the thing he created. It's in him. He is in it. It's in him. It's, it's not something he's looking at, but it's all going on inside of him. And the, the point is this. When you can see what's going on in the galaxies and begin to understand that with our feeble mind... Look, we use the word eternal, but we have no paradigm to even talk about eternal. You've got to be eternal to know what eternal is. God knows. But here's the, here's the neat thing. 
Solomon said, who can build a house for you? Heavens of heavens can't contain you. Heaven is your throne. Earth is your footstool. Who can build a house? He did not know that God had already built a house. He called it us. Did you not know that your bodies are a temple of the living God who is in you? Start it again. Now it's going to go back down to where that lady was and you'll see something else that is going to be important to you. The point is that you are as vast on the inside as space is on the outside. So when, when John says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, he's not blowing smoke. He's telling you, you don't know who you are because I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. On the inside. Say, well, say, then what does that make you? You're a God container. I'm going to read a passage of scripture. It's in Colossians chapter 2. It's in the Amplified Bible. And, um, and if you don't read the Amplified Bible, sometimes there are certain things that you'll miss. But the writer tells me something that is amazing to me. I have no problem believing that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Colossians 2, 9. This won't be that passage. Are you guys okay? I don't want to keep you past the football game. Uh, do you have the Amplified Bible there? Yeah, is that the Amplified Translation? It's not? It's, look at the passage. In, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. In him, in Jesus, the fullness of deity. The fullness of deity is the Trinity. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit dwells in him. And then he says... And you too have been filled with him. You are filled with him. You too have within you Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus said it to him. He says, I'm leaving, but 
I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and my father and I, we will come and we will live inside you. We will take up our abode in you. How do you do that? Through the Holy Spirit. You can't have God, the Holy Spirit, in your life and not be a part of God's family. Interestingly enough, you become a part of the Trinity. You're not, you're not the Trinity. You're just a member of the Trinitarian family. And you say, but when I was, I was trying to get this young lady to understand how easy it was to receive the Holy Spirit. And I said, he said he would give you if you ask the Holy Spirit. She says, okay. I said, ask him for the Holy Spirit. She said, okay, I'm asking. I said, did you, did you receive? She said, I don't know. I said, well, just lift your voice and just begin to pray in tongues. And she said, I can't do that. I said, all right, I'm going to begin to use my prayer language. And I said, whatever you hear me say, you just repeat it. She said, I don't want to make anything up. I said, I, I don't want you to think you're making anything up if I'm speaking a language. All you got to do is say what I'm saying. You may not know what I'm saying, but you're saying something. I said, do you have children? She said, yes. I said, when they, were, when they were small, did you ever try to get them to speak without saying something? Did you lean over the crib and say, mama, mama, or did you wait for them to get mature enough to say mama without coaching? And so I said, I'm talking. I said, it's a language. It's a real language. I need this language because I'm a part of the Trinity family. And in order for me to communicate with them, I need to have a language that communicates with God. It's a God language. And so I said, can you do this? And she started to follow me. She followed me for about a minute. And then next thing I knew, she was off on her own. She had her own prayer language. The writer says, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the spirit himself, not it, himself. The spirit himself. Holy Spirit is not an it. Holy Spirit is a masculine pronoun when he the holy spirit comes when he comes he will touch your life and he says and then there are moments in my life when i don't know how to pray as i ought but the spirit makes intercession for me with groanings that are too deep for words and all of this god stuff that's going on inside of me i've got communion you don't have to go to heaven to pray god put heaven in you Jesus says, I cast out demons by the Holy Spirit. I heal people by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says to a demon, come out, he says, come out, and the Holy Spirit says, I've got this. And he drives out the Spirit. Jesus says, Holy Spirit drives it out. In Luke, he says, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom has come upon you. And then one translation says, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, which is always an interesting phrase for me, because the first time that phrase appears in the scriptures, it's in the book of Exodus, where the, the Egyptian magicians are saying to Moses and through Moses and to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, we can't do this. And they say, why? He says, I think this is the finger of God. The power that they can't reproduce with their magic was just, God said to Moses, make fleas. And Moses made fleas, but they couldn't make fleas because it took the finger of God, the power of God. I tell people, don't let God give you the finger. Okay, that went over your head, which is probably a good thing. What happens? The two most important days in church history are Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is when all of the messengers that Jesus has sent to his disciples saying to them, he's alive. 
did work. So Jesus himself comes. And the Bible says they were in the room and the doors were shut and barred. And he just appears in the room. He doesn't open the door. He just... And his first words to them, and I can understand, were peace be with you. Don't be afraid. It's me. And he rebuked them because of their unbelief. I believe the church today needs a good rebuking because somehow we thought that God had lost control of everything. Heaven belongs to him. The earth he has given to the sons of men. And he's talking to these guys. You're the guys that I'm depending upon. You're the guys that... And then he looks at them and he says, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Someone say that. As the Father sent me, so send I you. Say it again. How did the Father send Jesus? First of all, he had a supernatural birth. He was born of a virgin. Supernatural birth. Then secondly, he had a supernatural water baptism. Thirdly, he had a supernatural baptism of the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent me, so send I you. He says to Nicodemus, unless you are born from above, unless you have a, a, a birth that has its origin in heaven, you can't even see what's going on around here. He says, and then you must be born of the Spirit and born of water. Jesus was baptized in water, not sprinkled. He was pushed under the water by a baptizer. John wasn't a Baptist, but he was a baptizer. (laughs) When Jesus came, he says, okay, you're going under. Why did Jesus get baptized so he could identify with us? We get baptized so we can identify with him. He was born without sin. But in order to be who he was to us, he had to identify with us. And the only way he could identify with us was to get water baptized. And as he comes up out of the waters, a voice out of heaven says, this is my beloved son. Dove descends and he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. As the father sent me, so send I you. And then here's what Jesus says in that room on resurrection evening. (sighs) Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. In that moment, they became born again. They had new life. They had resurrection life. Couldn't have resurrection life until he was raised from the dead. So that initial encounter with the Holy Spirit is for new birth encounter. But there's another encounter that happens on the day of Pentecost, and that's not for new birth, that's for power. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You don't know what you have, and maybe you don't know who you are, but he's given us this power. As the Father sent me, so send I you. He comes up out of the waters of baptism. And the Bible says, immediately he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He was led by the Spirit. Mark says he was driven by the Spirit. There are times when the Holy Spirit has led me some places. And there are times when the Holy Spirit has driven me some places because he knew I didn't want to go. And in that encounter in the wilderness with the enemy, the first thing the devil says to him is the last thing he heard from God. What did God say to him as he emerges from the waters? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the devil says, if you are, the son of God. He always has the right to test what you actually believe and what you last heard from God. What did you last hear from God? Is God still saying that? And then he said, Joseph, 
I had a supernatural birth. You have to have one. I had a supernatural water baptism. You have to have one. I have a supernatural baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have to have one. Go wait in Jerusalem until you have been endued or clothed with power from on high. And when that took place, a phenomena happened on that day, on Pentecost Day, the day of power, when the Spirit of God came into the room. The Bible says there came a sound from heaven. The sound came from heaven, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire. I don't know what it was like. I think about it every now and then because it's an event that never happened before. And they're sitting there and the guy across the room, wind is blown. He looks at his neighbor. He says, his neighbor says, why are you staring at me? He says, you got, you got fire on your head. He said, I do not. Yeah, you got fire. Ever since that wind came through, you got fire on your head. He said, are you serious? He said, reach up and touch it. I'm making something up here for you. He reaches up and that fire hits his hand and he says, Kika kando What would you have done if you got burnt and didn't know how to explain it? In that moment, something triggered in the church that has been happening for 2,000 years, and God is still dependent on you and on I to have a moment in which the fire releases something in us, and we're able to declare to the world that this God I serve, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. He's not dead. Get it right. You say, but I, you know, I just don't see the things that he says. No, no. I'm still doing it. Darlene Bishop has a, she's got a beautiful church in Dayton, Ohio. Her granddaughter answered the door one day and she said, uh, she said, honey, where's your, where's your daddy? She said, I don't know, grandma. My daddy working. She said, well, where is he working? She said, grandma, I don't know. My, my daddy working. How long has he been gone? Grandma, I don't know. My daddy working. When's he coming back? Grandma, I don't know. My daddy working. And no matter what she asked, she knew one thing. Her daddy was working. She didn't know where he was, didn't know what he was doing, didn't know when he was coming back, didn't know how long he'd been gone. All she knew was that her daddy was working. She, she said, tell him I was here. She went to the car. She said, as I put my hand on the car handle of the door, the door, and, and God said to me, did you recognize one thing she said? Did you recognize that there was one thing that she knew? She didn't know where he was. She didn't know what he was doing where he was. She didn't know when he was coming back. All she knew was that he was working. Even when you can't see him. <laughs> he's working. Even when you can't hear him, he's working. Even when you don't know what he's up to, he's working. You look at all the mess that's going on in the world today and think, okay, God has taken a back seat. No, no. See, Elijah could say to Baal, maybe Baal has gone on a vacation. Maybe Baal is taking a nap. Maybe Baal has even gone to the bathroom. But my God is working. Your God is working. And there are some things that God takes a lot longer to do than I wish. Because I know he could do it just like that. But what is it about God that thinks he's God and you're not? There's a passage Bishop in Isaiah. He's in Isaiah 34. And he talks about all of the prophetic words that have been given in various places. And then he said, look at all of these words. He says, no mate will be missing. A prophecy has a mate. And that mate is called the fulfillment. Your prophecy 
is waiting for a mate. I'm not talking about a husband or a wife. God said, I'm going to give you this. And the promise is the prophecy, but the this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And here's what he says in that passage in Isaiah. He says, the Holy Spirit gathers them. Now, here's the part. I want you guys to get this because you've been waiting for something. And God is saying to you, and you thought it was over, and you thought you missed it, and you thought, okay, but I want you to know, he says, he says, and my spirit has gathered the mates. Holy Spirit, first time you hear him mentioned is in Genesis 1. And God said, somebody say that, and what did God say? Let there be light. And there was light. But what the scripture says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the scriptures also tell us that the Holy Spirit was instrumental in that creative activity. My mentor called the Holy Spirit the executive agent of the Trinity. You say it, I'll do it. So when Jesus says, get out, Holy Spirit says, I've got this. When he says to the dead person, get up, Holy Spirit says, I've got this. When he touches that, that little platform that that young man is on and he's dead, and Jesus puts his hand on him and says, young man, get up. Holy Spirit says, I've got this. What is it that God has said to you that you don't know that the Holy Spirit already has it? He's already working on it. And even when you can't see it, he's working. Even when you can't understand it, he's working. Some things are like, I'll describe it like this. If you can figure out a title for this message, share it with me. Uh, Some time ago when our kids were small, I bought a big, big toy for them. And I made a decision that I wouldn't open it until they were asleep on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, I opened the box. It was a big box. And I saw all this stuff laying in this box. And I closed the lid and I saw something on the box that I hadn't seen when I bought it. What did I see? Assembly required. What God is saying to us is that some of the things that you are believing God for require assembly. He can do it this way, but what if a word that he's given to you is dependent upon the generosity of another person on the other side of the world? He's got to assemble it. He's got to bring it. There are things that are going on. He's got to allow certain events to take place in order to produce a hungry heart that says, God, I know you're in this just when I thought I was going to quit. My wife and I have been givers all of our married life and I mean we go after it and I've got promises about it and I remember one day I was in Tijuana no it wasn't Tijuana it was in uh, Cancun forget Tijuana <laughs> I had a beautiful room my wife was down at the swimming pool and I was up there having a conversation with God and I was telling him I said I don't see all this faithfulness stuff coming around. I said, I, I've been giving, I've, I've been sowing. We've been praying. You ever hear that song that McDowell says, we've been praying, we've been sowing. Now we're crying, heaven send the rain. And I'm saying, God, I'm waiting for some rain here. What's happening? And when I got it off my chest, I went down to the swimming pool. Two days later, I'm sitting in a room on the other side of the world, and a guy walks up to me and he says, my son told me to give this to you, and it was a piece of paper that looked like a check might be the paper. And he handed it to me, and he said, he said, to tell you there's more where this came from. He said, in a dark hour, you were the only one who invested in it. And that check was for $50,000. And it was like, 
it was almost like, I, I know God doesn't do stuff like this, but I felt like God said, see. <laughs> now, what were you saying back in Cancun? Because even when you couldn't see it, I was working. Our youngest son is a grown man with grandkids now, but when he was 17 years old, he told me that he wanted to live his own life and he was drinking and he was doing drugs and uh, he came home half high and, and uh, wanting to go to a graduation party that was going to start that night at 11 and I said he couldn't go and he said, Dad, everybody's going to be there. I said, well, not everybody. He says, why do you always make the rules? I said, because we believe in the golden rule around here. The one with the gold makes the rules. And he got upset. He ran out of the house. And he says, I'm leaving. And for two months, he was on his own. Call me one day. And he said, uh, I, I want to join the military, but you have to sign for me. And I said, well, what branch of the military do you want to join, son, who doesn't like saying yes, sir, and no, sir, and going to bed at a decent hour, getting up early, and doing work that you think is beneath you? I said, what branch do you want to join? What branch? The Marines. He wanted to join the Marines. The guy came to our house, sat in my living room, and told me how great a son I had. And I sat on my hands to keep from clapping. <laughs> they took him to Paris Island. 30 days after Paris Island, he calls home collect and says the operator says Kip is calling would you accept it we said sure and I got on the phone I said hello he said hello sir I said how are you doing he said sir I'm doing fine I said what's the marines like he said sir the marines is great I said what time do you get up in the morning he said sir I get up four o'clock every morning what time do you go to bed sir I go to bed at eight o'clock every evening it was sir, sir, sir. I couldn't get sir. I couldn't get him to say sir a single month. Thirty days with the Marines. God was doing something in his life. <laughs> his mother got on the phone. I said, "Would you like to speak to your mother?" He said, "Sir, I'd be happy to speak to your mother." She said, "Hi, Kip." He said, "Hello, sir." You think you've got a challenge, but all you need to know is that once Holy Spirit says, I'm on your side, I'm working for you, I've got this all sorted out. I've got a plan laid out. And if you'll just join me in worshiping and saying to me on a regular basis, all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so. Couldn't see it in that problem. But Holy Spirit wanted me to know. He said, I've got this. I've got this. He's, it's like he's saying, the thing that you are worried about isn't even going to happen. Boy got saved, got married, became an elder in the church, a prophet in the church. I couldn't see any of that. But Holy Spirit was saying, you got a lot of moving parts but I'm going to assemble them. I'm going to gather them and I'm going to make them happen. There's some people who aren't here yet, but they were waiting for this season because this building is now ready to receive those who have been saying, there's got to be a place where they love God. There's got to be a place where they serve God. There's got to be a place where, where Holy Spirit's real. There's got to be a place where worship is what it ought to be. It's not just putting on something, but it's telling God, you are the source of my strength. But you got to get this. You're bigger. You're bigger than that. You're bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. I know I've got prophetic words that are, that are yet to be fulfilled. I would like for them to be fulfilled while I'm still here on earth. But the fulfillment sometimes isn't just for you. It's for somebody in your life, somebody in your world 
and in your future. The glory is coming back. But what God has in mind can't happen. It won't happen apart from Holy Spirit. I've been renewed again and again in the Holy Ghost. I pray in tongues. I sing in tongues. I talk in tongues. I don't write in tongues yet, but I'm trying to find that place where it's super supernatural and to recognize that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in me. But he's not just in there by himself. Father's there. Cayenne doesn't get a a 10-year-old version of the Holy Spirit. He gets God, the Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit that you get. There is no baby version. There is no female version. There is no male version. I don't think there are any other categories that I deal with. That some people. But every now and then, you need to reconcile yourself to this reality. Nothing happens until something is declared. And I want you to stand up with me, especially those who've been part of this house. Yesterday, for, for me, my sense of yesterday was that something significant took place. I think you used the word shift. In Star Wars, there would come a moment when somebody knew something had taken place because there was a shift. They would say, there's a, sh there's a shift. I believe there's a shift. I believe Holy Spirit is asking this house this question. Are you ready for the glory? And even if you're not ready, do you want the glory? There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, your glory. Pam, could